our second installment of the Beyond the Ballot series, where we look at the key national security and economic challenges facing either a second Trump administration or an incoming Biden administration. Our Presidential Policy Hour series, which we did over the summer, was designed to basically look at these issues as we headed into the party conventions. This time, we are discussing these topics as we head into the presidential and vice presidential debates. We are extremely excited to have Michael Morrell with us today. Michael has had an illustrious 33, or had an illustrious 33 career, career at the Central Intelligence Agency, where he served as head of the Director of Intelligence, the top analyst, the deputy director of the entire CIA, and also served as acting director twice. Politico called Michael Morrell the Bob Gates of his generation, but seeing as he was the top analyst and the president's briefer, I like to call him the Jack Ryan of his generation. Michael currently serves as a senior contributor to CBS News and is host of the popular podcast, Intelligence Matters. He serves on numerous corporate boards. He is the author of two best-selling books, and we have so much to discuss today that I'm going to dispense with further um, biographic details and let you talk about that, Michael Morrell. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, Michael Morrell. The first question that, that came to mind, you know, really is about your biography. And you've had such a long career at the CIA. As I said, you were the top analyst. You know, I started my career as a very junior analyst at the CIA. You were somebody I looked up to greatly. I always was hoping to get my pieces in the Presidential Daily Briefing book. You served as the briefer to President Bush. You were with him on 9-11. You were with President Obama the day that we got bin Laden. Can you walk us through your career and what it was like to be with the president during those two moments? So I started out on the analytic side of the agency like you did. <laughs> um, and interesting to you, Halima, I started out as an energy analyst. So the first... <laughs> The first few years, um, I was working energy issues. It was the Iran-Iraq war. It was the second oil price spike. So there was a lot of focus on that, a lot of interest on that. I did that for a couple of years, and then I um, switched and focused on East Asia. So I did some work on Southeast Asia. I did some work on China, um, work on Japan, um, and a lot of work on North Korea. I was part of the team, a very, very small part of the team that discovered the North Korean nuclear weapons program. Um, so I was an analyst and a manager of analysts on East Asia for the first half of my career. And then I started a series of staff-like assignments. So I ran, I ran the staff that produced the President's Daily Brief. Um, I was George Tennant, who was the director of the agency and the head of the agency. Um, I was his executive and then I was George Bush's um, daily intelligence briefer during the first, first year as president. So yeah, I was with him on 9-11. And what was it like? I mean, can you talk us through like what it was like to be with President Bush at that moment? And again, what was it like to be with President Obama when we got bin Laden? So I remember, I remember 9-11 like it was yesterday. And I remember every detail. So, you know, I could walk you through the whole day and it would take two hours and I won't do that, of course. But um, if I were going to summarize it, Halima, I'd say it was a mixture of the intensity of doing my job and the surreal. So a couple of examples of the intensity of doing my job. Um, when we left Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, where we had stopped to take on food and water because we had no idea how long we'd be flying around, um, on the flight from there to off at Air Force Base in Omaha, where the president did a secure video teleconference with his national security team, the president asked to see me. So I went to his small office on Air Force One, which is not very big. Um, and it was the president, and it was Andy Card, his chief of staff, and it was me. And the president looked me in the eye and he said, Michael, who did this? Um, and I hadn't seen any intelligence at that point um, as to who was responsible. So I told him that. And so I told him he was going to get my best assessment, right? Not, not intelligence. And he said, I understand the caveat. Now move on. So I told him that there were two nation states with the capability to do this, Iran and Iraq. But I told him, Mr. President, neither of those countries has, has anything to gain, and both of them have everything to lose 
from doing something like this. So I don't think a nation state did this. I think when we, when we get to the end of the trail, we're going to find Al Qaeda and we're going to find Osama bin Laden. And I told him I was so confident in that that I would bet my children's future on it. Um, he then he then looked me in the eye again and he said, "When will we know?" Which, as you know, is the kind of question you get from a policymaker, and quite frankly, the kind of direct question you got from 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 President Bush. And there's no answer to that, right? So I did what most analysts do. I used context. So I very quickly went back in my mind and um, remembered previous attacks on the United States and how long it took us to find out. So I told him East Africa bombings took us two days to figure out it was Al Qaeda. The bombing of the USS Cole um, off the coast of Yemen, off the coast of Yemen, it took us two months to figure that out. Um, and the bombing of Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia, it took us a year to figure out that the Iranians were the one. So I told him, Mr. President, we may know soon, and then again, it may take some time. So that was you know, one example of the intensity of doing my job. Later that, that evening when we were flying back to Andrews, the CIA sent me a piece of intelligence that a European government had given to us. Um, and because, a government, because another government had given it to us, the credibility of it wasn't clear, the sourcing of it wasn't clear, but the message was profound. It said, what happened this morning is the first of two waves of attacks on the United States. So another attack is coming. So that was, you know, he had just suffered through, as president, the greatest attack on the country in the history, in its history, and here's his intelligence brief for telling him another one's coming. Um, so an example of the surreal, and there were many, many moments that day, um, but probably the most memorable is as we were landing at Andrews, the president's military aide was looking out the windows on the left side of the aircraft, and he saw me looking at him. We'd become friends over the previous nine months, and. Um, he saw me looking at him and he waved me over and I walked over and he said, look out. And so I looked out the window and there was an F-16 on the wingtip of Air Force One. And Halima, it was so close that you could see the pilot. You could see the pilot facial features. Um, you could see the pilot looking at us and in the distance you could see the still smoldering Pentagon. Um, then the president's military aide said, said something to me that still send shivers up my spine today when I talk about it, which is, he said, do you know why they're there? There's another one on the other wingtip. Do right. you know why they're there? And I said, no. And he said, their job is if someone fires a surface-to-air missile at us on final approach, their job is to put themselves between that missile wow. and the United States. So that's 9-11. That's um, you know, you fast, fast forward 10 years, and um, I'm with President Obama. Uh, the day we get bin Laden. And I really don't remember that particular day as well as I remember two other days. Um, and the first day I remember in the bin Laden operation was back in August of 2010. So, you know, a number of months before the raid. And it was in August of 2010 that the head of our counterterrorism center came to Director Panetta and me and said, I need to see the two of you alone. And so we went into the director's office, and he said, we found, this, we found this guy who we believe to be bin Laden's courier, and here's, what his, here's where his residence is, and here's what it looks like. And the hair on the back of my neck stood up because it looked like a place where bin Laden might be. And then the other, you know, and then fast forward beyond the, op the actual operation. So President Obama... By the way, President, the first phone call President Obama made when we knew for sure that we got bin Laden was to President Bush, which is kind of nice. Wow. But um, so, so President Obama, knowing that I was with President Bush on 9-11, asked me to go to Dallas um, to brief President Bush on the whole operation. So I took a couple people with me. We spent two and a half hours with President Bush, walked him through the whole intelligence story about how we found him and the whole operational story of the raid. He was like a kid in a candy shop. He wanted to know every detail. Um, at the end of the two and a half hours, he said, you know, Laura and I, we're going to go to the movies tonight, but this is better than any movie you could possibly ever see, so we're staying home. Um, and then he did something that that I'll remember forever. He got up and he walked over to his desk and he, he pulled out his commander-in-chief challenge coin. You know, military units have these challenge coins that they trade with each other. And the president has one that says commander in chief on it. And he had never given me one before. So he pulled out three of them and he gave one to each of us. And when he slapped it into my hand and I looked into his eyes, 
I could see closure, right? That this was, it was closing the 9-11 chapter for him. And it kind of was for me because I was with him on 9-11 too. Wow, that's such an extraordinary story. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion sort of to go to the present day, you know, over the weekend, there was so much discussion about, you know, the whole presidential health crisis with President Trump, discussing whether this is really a national security crisis. Um, and then I just was wondering, like, what are your thoughts on this? Because there was a lot of rhetoric from the journalists saying this is a national security crisis. And the more sort of seasoned hands were sort of much more sober in their assessment about the, the national security risks entailed in a health crisis. Yeah, so I didn't think that we needed to worry about somebody trying to take advantage of the situation. Right. The reason I didn't worry about it was not because the president was, was sick. I mean, that's something to worry about, but I was thinking more about the adversaries. So I was thinking mm -hmm. about Russia, right? Well, Russia wants President Trump to be reelected, so it's not gonna right. do anything to undermine that. I actually believe, contrary to what the intelligence community says, I actually believe the Chinese, while they're unhappy with his policies, um, like the, the fact that they have an open field in the world to run with, right? And I actually think the Chinese want him reelected. Um, so they're not going to do something. They're not going to try to grab Taiwan, right? That would actually undermine, right. strengthen the president. Same with the Iranians, right? The Iranians right now are, are, are laying very, very low because they're afraid, actually, that, that the president wants to create an incident with them that he could use electorally. Right. So they're, they're keeping their heads down. And then the North Koreans, I really believe that Kim Jong-un still believes that he can somehow turn his personal relationship with the president into sanctions relief without giving up his nuclear weapons. And he's not going to risk that. So when I look at sort of all the adversaries and people who might try to take advantage of this, I don't see anybody with an incentive to do so. Well, can I ask you a follow-on question? Because I mean, I remember being, you know, a young analyst at the agency. It seems so long ago that I could call myself young, but I remember there was a lot of discussion, you know, in the morning meetings about the health of world leaders. That was like a key part of the job of like a leadership analyst. I'm just wondering how foreign intelligence agencies are, you know, how much resources are they now devoting to trying to figure out the issue of President Trump's health? I think the Russians, the Chinese, um, even some of our allies, right, who, who I won't mention, um, I think are probably trying to aggressively figure out um, exactly what's going on with his health. Um, you know, at the agency, we not only had leadership analysts, but we yeah. had doctors, right? Yeah. The job it was to assess the health of foreign leaders. And they, of course, would get intelligence reporting um, on the health of a leader, but they would actually watch video, right, and um, listen to the leader and and try to make assessments. And it's it's really hard, right, when you don't have the patient in front of you um, and you can't run tests and you can't ask questions to do that. And I always thought, Halima, that we we overestimated the risk associated with the health of foreign leaders because. Wow. We forgot, we forgot to factor in the fact that foreign leaders get the best health care, right? Health, right? Um, you know, the, the, the emir of Kuwait just died, right? Where did he die? He died in the United States, right? At the, right. one of the best medical institutions in the world, right? So they get the best health care. The president just got the best health care. And that makes a big difference, right? And I think we often underestimated the, the, the positive impact of that. So when we were talking about you know how adversaries might or might not, in the case you brought up, use this health crisis, I'm wondering if you can talk through, if we go through the list that you just talked about, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, how do you think a sort of second Trump administration would approach these countries? How do you think a incoming Biden administration? And then just your assessment in terms of what do the risks each one of these countries poses to the United States? Of all the challenges out there from a national security perspective, I think China is at the top of the list, and there is a large between number one and number two. Um, it's China, China, China. Um, China poses a very significant challenge to the United States. It poses a greater challenge to the United States than the Soviet Union, because it actually has significant strengths, right? Whereas the Soviet Union had fundamental weaknesses, and China's got some fundamental strengths. Um, 
And you know, China, the the what the Chinese are trying to do is they're trying to garner as much influence in the world, economic, political, diplomatic, to be able to influence countries to pursue policies that are in China's in China's narrow interest, right? And of course, that's what we're trying to do too. But through most of our history, right, we've had a pretty broad definition of what's in American interest, right? American exceptionalism. You know, the very definition of American exceptionalism is that if if we can raise up everybody, that's going to raise us up too, right? The Chinese don't think that way. They think very narrowly. So this competition really matters, right? And the competition over technology. Um, and Halima, I believe that that the relationship between the United States and China is really going to determine what the world's going to look like in five, 10, 15, 20 years, right? And in my mind, there's a there's a spectrum to what that relationship could look like, right? And at one end of the spectrum is cooperation, the kind of cooperation we saw between Barack Obama and Xi Jinping on climate change the last year of Obama's presidency. And then you move over to what I would call healthy competition, right? So I was an economist, right? So I see competition as a good thing, right? Um, so healthy economic competition, healthy diplomatic competition, then you kind of slide further to the right and you get to unhealthy competition, right? You get to um, the Chinese stealing intellectual property um, and giving it to their companies. You see the Chinese subsidizing industries to a significant advantage like Huawei. You see the United States restricting in Chinese investment in the United States, right? Or you see the United States trying to um, put a national security filter over supply chains, right? All of that is what I would call unhealthy competition. And then at the far right of the spectrum is actually conflict and war. And I'm not predicting it, but there's a there's not a zero probability, right? There's a there's a positive probability that at some point the United States and China will end up in conflict. And there are there are some fundamental dynamics that are dragging us to the right on that spectrum. Right. And I think it's I think it's the job of the leadership in Washington and the leadership in Beijing to try to figure out how to avoid ending up at the right end of the spectrum and try to stay at the left hand end of the spectrum. As I think about, you know, and then and then Russia's probably next. Right. Russia's fundamentally weak, right? Um, um, both demographically and economically, right? They're a declining power. Um, Iran is a is a regional issue. Um, North Korea is with the exception of nuclear weapons, a regional issue. So, you know, much less important. Obviously, you got to pay attention to them and worry about them and come up with sound policies. But China is the issue. Um, I think in a in a Biden administration, you would see in the first couple hundred days, you would see um, a real attempt to put together a China strategy where all these different pieces, you know, economic, technological, diplomatic, military, all these pieces come together. Um, whether they're successful or not, I don't know, but I think they'll try to do that. I think they'll try to do that with our allies. I think they'll try to talk to our allies before they put the strategy together. You know, so go to the Australians, go to the Japanese, go to the Europeans and say, how do you see China? How do you want this relationship to go, right? What are, where are Chinese interests and our interest in conflict and where are they, you know, where are they heading in the same direction? And then we put our policy together and we try to bring our allies along with us in opening the playing field to where the Chinese are playing by the rules and saying no to China where they're not playing by the rules as a group, right? Right. China, China has a history of when they get, quote, ganged up on by a bunch of countries, you know, changing their direction strategically. So I think that will be the approach of the Biden administration. Um, I think a lot of people think in a second Trump administration that the China policy will remain um, tough and the rhetoric will remain tough and we might see a return to tariffs. I actually have my doubts about that. Um, you know, what, what drives this president, in my view, is number one, ego, number two, his personal financial situation, and number three, his family. Um, and I think when he looks at China in a first term, he's thinking about getting reelected, right? He's thinking about his base. He's thinking about his ego, right? I think in a second term, it might be different because his base is not going to matter that much anymore to him. 
Um, so I think in a second term, you might see him try to cozy up a little bit to China the way he has done with Russia, thinking about a Trump Tower in Beijing or a Trump Tower in Shanghai. So I think you may see a very different approach to China in a second term than we saw in a first term. Wow. And then if we think about Iran and North Korea. Yeah, so I think no matter who wins, I think there's going to be a deal with Iran. I think the Iranians have been squeezed so hard, and now you put COVID on top of that. And COVID has really devastated Iran in a way that most people don't understand. Um, I think, you know, with the economic sanctions and now COVID, I think the Iranians have to cut a deal. Um, and I think they will, no matter who wins. I think the difference will be whether the deal is done by the Iranians out of, out of intense pressure and they walk out of it with shame rather than some pride, which I think is what we'll get in a second Trump term, um, which means that you'll have a nuclear deal, but the relationship will be remain incredibly antagonistic and dangerous. And I think in a, in a, in a Biden administration, what they'll try to do is give the Iranians a diplomatic off-ramp so that they can save okay. some space, right? So that they can have some pride here in the deal in the hope that we not only have a nuclear deal, but we can you know, slowly begin to talk to them about other issues. So I think there'll be a deal, but the nature, and the nature, the facts of the deal might be very similar, but the, um, the ambiance around the deal would be fundamentally different. Um, on North Korea, that's just a really, really hard one. Um, I don't believe that Kim Jong-un has any interest in ever giving up his nuclear weapons because they provide him legitimacy um, at home. Um, they provide him the deterrence he believes he needs against both South Korea and the United States from invading North Korea, which he actually worries about. So I don't think he has any intention um, of ever giving them up. I think he's trying to, as I said earlier, I think he's trying to hope that um, his personal relationship with the president will lead to some sanctions relief. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so I think you'll probably see with North Korea on again, off again negotiations, on again, off again um, steps by North Korea to get attention um, and to say, you know, we're dangerous, please come talk to us. Um, so I don't think that's going to get resolved. Um, but I also, I also don't worry about the North Koreans actually attacking us with nuclear weapons because Kim Jong-un is very rational. Um, he knows that that would be the end of him and the end of his regime and the end of his country. Um, I worry much more about the sale of a nuclear weapon, the North Koreans selling a nuclear weapon to somebody else. I think we can deter him from use. Deterring him from a sale, I think, is another, is another issue, right? That's harder. And an important thing to remember about North Korea, an important context about North Korea, is they literally have sold everything they have ever made. Um, you know, they sold to the Syrians the technology to build a nuclear weapon. Um, and so the only thing they've never sold is a nuclear weapon. So, you know, we'll see if, if that happens someday. That would be very bad. You talked about the Iranian regime really being, you know, hit so hard because of COVID. I'm wondering if you could talk about the sort of the COVID effects on, you know, multiple countries. And there's been a lot of discussion. We did an event a couple of weeks ago for the Atlantic Council, and there was a real question about the sort of the race for the vaccine. And are we going to be engaged in some sort of like, you know, global national security challenge because of the, the vaccine race and the competition over the vaccine? So I think, yes. Um, I think that Russia sees it that way and China sees it that way. And I think we actually see it that way as well. Um, whoever gets the vaccine first, right, is going to be able to, um, to say that they were first and is going to be able to provide it to other countries. The Russians are already selling their first vaccine, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, right. I would not buy it. Um, but some countries <laughs> are. Um, and so absolutely, you know, um, the Chinese have used COVID to try to gain significant diplomatic influence around the world. And they're doing it through, you know, traditional diplomatic tools like simply making phone calls. So Chinese leaders every day are picking up the phone and calling the leaders of other countries and saying, you know, 
how are you doing? Is there anything you need? Uh, is there any way we can help, right? We're not doing that. Um, the Chinese have provided medical personnel and personal protective equipment to 120 countries. Um, and they're also, they're also using both overt and covert messaging um, to send the message that they've been able to manage this, right? It might've started in China, but they've been able to manage it and the West hasn't. Um, and they've been the one to help and the West hasn't. So they are, they are using this in a very aggressive way to try to, to try to gain some points on that, on that influence scoreboard that I talked about earlier. Wow. Um, we're going to go to my colleague, Matt Hedberg, senior tech analyst covering cybersecurity. Hey, thanks, Halima. Thanks, Michael, for doing this super informative. Um, you know, I had a question on cybersecurity. Um, in a post-COVID world where, you know, there's obviously elevated levels of work from home and school from home, as well as more significant use of, of things like, you know, Amazon, public cloud. You know, how do you think our nation's posture around cybersecurity changes? And then as a follow-up, under a Biden administration, do you think the posture around cybersecurity changes meaningfully from a, a Trump presidency? So I think the risk has definitely gone up. Um, you know, there is no there is no platform that is fully secure. Um, the main intelligence services in the world, including ours, are capable of amazing things in terms of getting inside networks. Um, so there isn't a piece of technology, Matt, that I trust, right? There isn't a piece of technology that I would um, use to talk about something classified or proprietary. Um, so, you know, I believe that right now, you know, the Chinese and the Russians and, again, some of our allies um, are probably aggressively um, trying to get inside Zoom and being successful about it and getting inside corporate meetings and, um, I have no doubt about that. Um, and and so I think the risk has gone up, but I think in general, I think in general, there's a growing awareness of the cyber threat. I remember when I got out of government and I would in 2013 and I would talk to boards, they didn't they didn't think about they didn't think of, they were not thinking about the threat. Um, and then target happens and then Sony happens and some of the other major hacks happen. And so <clears throat> I think awareness has grown significantly in the last five to seven years. Um, I think that that cybersecurity has improved significantly, um, in particular in the important the important industries, um, finance, telecommunications, energy, you know, the critical infrastructure. I think it's much, much improved today. Um, but I do think it's still important to remember that offense has an advantage here over defense. So if you think about if you think about a football game and you said, okay, the, the offensive line gets to move one second, right, before the defensive line gets to move, that would be a huge advantage, right? And the the adversary is always studying the defenses. Um, of the person they're attacking and always coming up with new approaches, right? And that's never gonna change. Um, and so defense is always gonna lag a little bit. So this is a constantly changing game, right? Um, and obviously the cybersecurity industry is huge and growing and um, it's a fascinating industry. Um, I think there's gonna be some consolidation in it over time. Um, there has to be. Um, in, terms of, in terms of government policy, um, I think the Biden administration is going to make an attempt to try to to try to figure out what the proper role is between the government and the private sector with regard to um, with regard to cybersecurity. But I think the message I would leave you all with is, if you're waiting for the government to ride in on a horse to save you, you shouldn't be doing that. Right? <laughs> you should be taking care of your own security because I. I have real doubts about whether the government's ever going to figure this out. This is complicated mm. right? in a lot of different ways. What's an American company? What's not? What's classified? What's not? Who should do this in the government? How does information flow? Right? It's re it, what's legal? What's not? What's liability? What's not? I, I, I just fear that it's going to take a long, long time, if ever. So the bottom line is you got to take care of yourself. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Lima. Thank you. So now we're going to go to some of the questions. A number of listeners have actually submitted questions. 
And basically the first one I'm going to go with is about transition. So the question is, how would the Iranians, Saudis, and Russians potentially plan to back channel to the Biden administration? And what, if it's, an, if it's a Biden administration, and what would they hope to achieve? And is there any strategic reason for a Biden team to get an early start in terms of outreach? So given what happened in 2016, I'm pretty certain, I don't know, but I'm pretty certain that the Biden transition would be extraordinarily reluctant to engage um, officially or even unofficially with another government um, until they're actually in office. Um, I think it's 2016 is just too fresh in everybody's mind and people see the early engagement you know, with the Russians and the Emiratis and others as um, something that shouldn't have happened. So I think there will be a reluctance on the part of the Biden administration to do that. And having said that, there's a lot of countries who are going to be trying to engage, right, and trying different ways to engage. But I think the Biden transition is going to be very cautious. Okay. Next question is, how has the role of the CIA evolved in recent years? And there's another question this client asked, what does the CIA do badly? I would actually ask, what does the CIA do well? But if you could sort of take that question. Yeah. Um, so the CIA has evolved in very significant ways, right? So um, I think 9-11 was one, was one inflection point, right, where we actually, um, pre-9-11, were collection and analysis focused and post 9-11, we were covert action focused. We were focused on paramilitary activities against terrorists. And it was almost CIA going back to its Office of Strategic Services World War II roots, right? Uh, and that's where we were for you know, a good 10 years after 9-11. Um, now it's in the process of transitioning again. Um, and I think 2016 is probably the inflection point with regard to the second transition. And the second transition is a transition from terrorism and counterterrorism and paramilitary activities back to traditional spying um, on our peer and near peer competitors, right? Like China and Russia. So I think we're going through another transition right now. Um, so what does the CIA do badly? Um, the CIA... The CIA is horrible at saying no. Presidents will ask CIA to do things in terms of covert action, right? CIA is the only organization in government that's allowed to do covert action, that's allowed to conduct foreign policy or military activities secretly, right? And presidents, um, when they get stuck and they don't know what to do about a particular problem, are often eager to turn to the CIA and say, hey, can you take care of, can you help us with this problem? And CIA is horrible at saying, no, we can't do that, right? We can't, we can't solve that problem for you. And I can't really give you examples, but CIA, as you know, is, is a can-do organization. It wants to solve And, um, you know, there was a couple of times in the Obama administration where, where we were asked to think about a covert action, and I actually came back and said, you know, we can't, we can't make a difference. We just, we, there's nothing in our toolkit that we can do that's going to change the outcome for you here. So we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't waste, re we shouldn't waste resources on this. We shouldn't take risks. We shouldn't take reputational risks for the United States, right? So we have a hard time saying no. We, I want to ask the follow-on to that because you mentioned the toolkit. So I want to ask you, you know, where is the sort of toolkit for national security? I mean, we can go through like diplomacy, military power, intelligence. Like, if you had to assess the health of these, you know, very potent tools, what does it look like? It looks like a D minus. Okay, wow. Across the board. Now, some are worse than others. So, um, the, the military piece um, is not as robust as you think it would be if you look simply at defense spending. Okay. Um, and the reason it's not robust is because we have been focused on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency for the last 20 years. And during those 20 years, the Russians and the Chinese have been very aggressive in advancing their conventional weapons capability. And to the point where if we had to fight a war today, 
against China in East Asia or Russia on its periphery that we would struggle to win and could even lose that war. So that's how much the military situation has changed over the last 20 years. Um, so there's catching up to do that doesn't necessarily have to do with more money. It has to do with the military coming up with new, new, new ways of fighting, new concepts of fighting, and not focusing on how many troops they have or airplanes they have or ships that they have, which is what they've done traditionally. So that's the military piece. The diplomatic piece is the weakest that I've ever seen it in my professional career. Um, the State Department was struggling for, before the Trump administration, the State Department was struggling because it did not get the resources that it needed for a very, very long time. And the Trump administration has, has made that worse in my view. Um, a lot of seasoned diplomats have left the service, have left the foreign service. So the diplomatic tool is extraordinarily weak and needs to be rebuilt. Um, the economic policy tool, right? Um, we've got the negative side of it down, right? Sanctions and secondary sanctions, right? And boy, do we love that tool now. Um, we really kind of figured out how to really squeeze somebody. But we don't use economics in a positive way, right? As the Chinese do. Um, and we need to figure out some sort of, some sort of way for the government to use government money to leverage private sector money so that we are providing development investment rather than development assistance to countries that matter in this competition with China. So, you know, that's a that's a that's a big that's a big thing in this competition with China that we have to do and we don't have a positive story to tell there. We only have a negative story to tell. And lastly, um you know, during the Cold War, we fought very effectively in the information space, right? In, you know, with Radio Free Europe um, and those kind of tools, right? Um, and we don't we don't use those kind of we don't use those kind of tools today. We don't play the same game that the Russians and Chinese play in terms of information operations. And I'm not, I would not advocate using disinformation because I don't think it's at the end of the day effective. Um, but we should be much more aggressive. Um, in telling our own story and pushing back on their story about how their system is better than ours. You know, we should be highlighting um, the difficulties in the Russian economy. We should be highlighting the political challenges that a China or Russia face domestically, right? And the lack of fundamental freedoms they have and um, what happens in those societies. And we just need to play a much stronger information game. So across all of those tools, there's work to be done. Well, I want to ask you about one more tool. This has just come in. We have a question about artificial intelligence. Like, how do you see that in the toolkit for national defense? And how do you look at American technology dominance in AI versus China or Russia? So as, 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 as you all know, there's a, a set of technologies, right, where we are competing with China, um, where both the Chinese and us have see those technologies as the key to our economic future and the key to military success and the key to intelligence success. And AI is the most important of those, right? Because it can sit on top of all the others, um, whether it's biotechnology or quantum computing or whatever, right? AI is, is, is the most important. The Chinese are ahead of us in AI today. Um, and what we need to do is we need to figure out how to make investments in American AI in a way that's consistent with our, our free market values, right? Um, which I still believe in, and um, I'm sure many of your listeners do as well. But we have to find a way for the government to invest in basic R&D, um, invest in, in, in um, the work on AI that's being done in universities, um, a lot more grants. Um, I would not pick winners and losers in terms of companies. Um, but I'd be much more aggressive in investing in fundamental AI research. Um, if not, we're going to continue to fall behind. Can I just ask one follow-up on that? Do you think that um, an incoming Biden administration shares that assessment of all, when you think about the toolkit, I mean, how do you think, you know, the Trump team views what you've just said? And how do you think an incoming Biden team would sort of 
Are they aligned with the assessment that you just gave? Because I found it a stunning assessment when you talked about the military, when you talked about the potential American losses against the China and the Russia. I, I find that to me like the most stunning takeaway of our conversation today. That judgment um, is the judgment of the last National Defense Strategy Commission on which I served. It was the unanimous wow. view of our commission. Um, and people can go read. And, and that sentence right. I about struggle to win and possibly could use that language. Wow. And obviously, these technologies, right, to the extent the Chinese get ahead, strengthens them militarily relative to us. I think both the Trump administration and the Biden folks see this exactly the same way that, that I just mm -hmm. explained it. I don't think the Trump administration has taken the right approach. They've taken a protectionist approach, right? to this, and I think really we need to go on the offense, right, in terms of, of um, AI development. You know, Eric Schmidt is, um, is leading a commission on AI. Uh, I think it's extraordinarily important. They've put out some interim reports. Um, I think their final report and their final recommendations are going to be along the lines that I talked about. Fantastic. Now, I have another question that came in, and this one is, um, I would say, a little bit outside the realm of you know being an analyst of like foreign developments, but it's coming in from some of our clients in Canada about the U.S. And the question is, what do you think would potentially happen in this situation if President Trump were not to accept a loss? Um, a, I know that might be a little bit outside the realm that you talk about, but I think people are sort of wondering how does the role of various government agencies work in if, if we had a situation like that. What is the, what would the what would the role of the military be, for example? So the the truthful answer is we don't know. It's never happened before. Um, I would, and and I worry about this in a close in a close election. I worry about it. You know, if the election were today, it would be a Biden landslide. Um, and quite frankly, every day it becomes a bigger landslide. The polls are moving sharply against the, against the president. Um, but in a close election, if the president says, no, um, there was fraud in this election, I actually won and I'm not leaving, um, you know, first it would go to the courts and it would end up at the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court said, no, President Trump won, then he's not going anywhere. But if the Supreme Court said, no, you lost and he still refused to go, um, we that's never happened. So I... I would not want the military to intervene, right? All of a sudden, we'd become a like a third world country here in the military determining mm -hmm. the outcome of an election. I think that's a very bad thing. Um, I would hope in that situation that the Secret Service would do the right thing, um, that the Capitol Police acting on behalf of the United States Congress, you know, would would do the right thing. But it, it's a it's an open question because it's never happened before in American history. And I think the last point I would make is, is you know, there's a ritual that happens in elections. And you can watch, you can watch it play out in election after election. And what happens is for the loser, right, after an election is decided, both the winner comes out and makes a statement and the loser comes out and makes a statement. And when the loser first comes out, their people are angry. Right? You can hear people yelling and saying, you know, fight on and all these kind of things. And when the loser says, no, this is over, right? Congratulations to the winner. You can actually feel the temperature in the room go down. And I don't think President Trump is going to do that. Right? I don't think he's ever going to come out and congratulate Joe Biden. Uh, I don't think he's ever going to come out on a stage and say, you know, we lost. I don't think he's going to do that. And the risk to me in that is that that some of his extreme followers, you know, on the fringe will come out into the streets and actually will be violent because of his refusal to accept the outcome. So I really worry about this. Um, another question that just came in is about sort of, I think, following on from your observations about the military and about the sort of rhetoric that we've heard about a, a broken military um, that he, that President Trump inherited. How does that stack up against your observations? Yeah, so absolutely. There's no doubt, right, that that, that assessment that I gave you earlier, right. that was the state of the United States military that President Trump inherited, 
right? And it was a function of of what we had to do after 9-11 in terms of, of counterterrorism. And it was a function of the choices we made in Iraq and Afghanistan with regard to counterinsurgency after 9-11, right? And it was also a function of the, the Budget Control Act, right? And the deep cuts to defense funding in the final years of the Obama administration. So, so President Trump didn't create this problem, right? He inherited it. It needs to be fixed. But it's certainly it's certainly not his fault. Right. Okay. And just a little forward leaning on this one again, like if you had to think about how, you know, if you had an incoming Biden administration, I mean, we're going to have scarcity of resources dealing with a the pandemic situation. I mean, what type of funding do you see both for the Defense Department? And I would also say for the intelligence services as well as part of that question. I think it's gonna go down. I think it's gonna go down. Um I think you'll see cuts to both defense spending and you'll see cuts to intelligence spending. I think um, both from a from a budget deficit perspective um, and from a, a domestic priorities perspective, right, in terms of um, some of the things the Biden administration wants to do domestically. Um, you know, in, 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 in the military world, they talk about ends, ways, and means, right? The ends are what you're trying to accomplish the the means are what are the resources you have to accomplish those ends and then the ways are how do you do that and so if if the the means right go down if the amount of resources you have go down then one of two things has to adjust either you have to adjust your ends your objectives in the world or you got to change the way you do things and i actually believe that there is room and many of my friends in the military believe there's room for the military to do things differently, to adjust to what the Russians and Chinese have done um, with new concepts, new fighting concepts um, that will allow us to pursue the same ends with fewer means. But that's a big cultural change, right. and it's a big challenge to members of Congress who today, right, whose constituents rely on the current structure of how things are done in the military. Well, we are coming up on our last 10 minutes of our hour together, and I actually have a, a couple questions I want to sort of get in there. And I think you've already touched on it, but it is that sort of question you always wrap up with in terms of like, what, what is that sort of event that keeps you up at night that we haven't discussed? What are, what are you sort of most concerned about beyond the sort of obvious discussions about sort of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea? Yeah, Helena, that's a that's a great question, and it's a question that um, I got when I did public talks um, and and you know small group talks when I was still in government, when I was the deputy director and the acting director, um, and it's a question I still get today when I do something like this. And when I was in government, I really felt that I needed to answer the question with a national security answer. So I would say I would always say terrorists with nuclear weapons. Um, and Al Qaeda has been interested in acquiring nuclear weapons even before 9-11. ISIS has been interested in acquiring weapons of mass destruction. Um, and I worry about that because if they ever got their hands on a weapon of mass destruction, they would use it, right? There is no deterring a terrorist group the way you, you can deter a nation state from using weapons of mass destruction. So I worry about that. But that's not the thing that I really worry about. And it's not the thing that I even worried about when I was deputy director and acting director. And the thing that I really worry about is our inability here in the United States to get our political act together. Because at the end of the day, the national security of a country is determined by the strength of its economy and the strength of its society, right? And if, if we can't get our act together politically so that our politicians can come together, make compromises that move us forward as a nation, then it doesn't matter. All of the things that we talked about don't matter, right, if we don't get our act together here at home. So that's what really worries me. And I want to ask a follow on, just because for the sake of bipartisanship, um, we had someone write in saying, I mean, do you think the Democrats would accept a loss as well? I mean, so the question of like both sides are so deeply invested in this election. I mean, do you have concerns on the other side as well about if President Trump wins, how Democrats and supporters will react? No, I don't. I, I, I know Joe Biden, and Joe Biden will accept a loss. But 
I'm not sure all of his supporters will. I'm not sure the extreme of the Democratic Party would accept the loss, right? Um, I think like the extreme of, of Trump's coalition, right, the extreme of Biden's coalition could come out into the streets as well. And I think that everybody should, everybody should, should remember this, that even if Joe Biden wins, the, the, the polarization of American politics doesn't end. It goes on. Right, it will continue. Um, President Trump is not the cause of the polarization. He is a symptom of the polarization. Right, um, the middle in American politics is gone, um, and you know there is no there is no normal distribution. Right, there's now two humps that are pretty far away from each other in terms of where people are ideologically, and so the extremes are dominating, and that's not going to end if President Biden win, if, if if Vice President Biden wins the election. I mean, to sort of wrap up as well, I want to ask you another question that I'm sure you always get, or there's a version of this, is kind of question about when you think about your career in government and what you've done subsequently, you know, what gives you the most happiness when you look back? And what were the most, what was the most challenging thing that you did in your career? Yeah, so you asked me one of these questions before, but not the, not the other one. So you, this is very good. I have to shake it up a little bit. Yeah. So um, the thing that I think I am most proud of is not and most happy about um, is not any substantive issue I ever worked on. It's not the fact that I was the president's briefer. It's not the fact that I was the deputy director. It's the fact that I took the analytic side of the agency from a male dominated culture to, I don't know if this is the right word, but a post-sex, post-sexist culture. I agree. So when I joined the agency, it was mostly male analysts. It was a, a very masculine culture. Um, today, more than half the analysts are women. Today, more than half the total number of managers are women. Um, today, more than half the senior leadership is women. Three of the last six heads of analysis have been women. I'm really proud of that. I was a beneficiary of that, actually. I, I, I feel like I need to thank you for that, actually. I was a benef I mean, I joined, and I had an entire female reporting chain. You know, and I, I, I think the country's better off for it. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, not only the right thing to do, but the country is better off for it, and the agency's better off for it. The hardest thing. Um, so the CIA sends people to dangerous places. Um, CIA sends people to war zones, just like the military does. Um, and in some, in some ways, um, we put p people at more risk because they're out there alone, as opposed to surrounded by a bunch of guys with weapons. Um, so we lose people. Um, we have, as you know, we have a wall in our main lobby where we put stars up of the people we've lost in the line of duty. Um, and during my time as deputy director and acting director, um, we lost people. And without a doubt, not even close, the hardest thing I had to do was talk to the families of those people. So spouses, children, um, siblings, parents, um, absolutely the hardest thing I had to do. And I learned, Halima, I learned that almost to a person, those people wanted to know three things about their loved one. They wanted, they wanted to believe that they were doing something that really mattered to the country. They believed that, they, they wanted to believe that that person was really good at their job. And they wanted to believe that their coworkers really liked that person. And so I would spend, you know, I would, before, before I met with a family member, I would take the, the, the individual's personnel file home with me and I'd pour over it looking for examples of those three things that I could share with them. I, at this point, always have to thank um, you for being with us today and you know, thank you, you know, frankly, for your service to this country. Um, but before I conclude, I want one last question in. This is like my surprise question in to Michael Morrell. Top book picks 
for people here to read. Um, if you could give us like the one book that you think we all need to read between now and the election, what, what's your top pick? So I'll give you I'll give you two. Okay, so Bob Gates just came out with a new book. Um, and it's organized around it's organized around issues. So there's a chapter on Russia, a chapter on China, a chapter on North Korea. And he goes through the entire history of the issue, where we are today, and what he thinks we need to do. And then H.R. McMaster just came out with a book as well that does exactly the same thing. So I actually used both of those books as references. So when I have to go on TV and talk about X, Y, or Z, I pull those books down. So um, um, there are two very important books by two remarkably talented and gifted national security um, experts. So I would definitely spend some time with those. And I would actually recommend everyone listening and watching today to read your books and listen to your podcast, Intelligence Matters. And again, I cannot thank you enough for spending an hour with us today. I can't thank you enough for everything you've done to keep all of us safe at night. This has been an outstanding discussion, and we are so thrilled that we got to spend an hour with you today. So thank you so much, and thank you everyone for listening today. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.